Hey folks, welcome to this week's News and Community Spotlight. The release of Unreal Engine 423 is coming right up. In the meantime, you can try new features in the previews, which are now available on the Epic Games launcher. Try out the new Chaos Physics and Destruction System, the Skin Weight Profile System, the new Unreal Insights tool, and loads of virtual production upgrades. You'll also see significant improvements to the Niagara workflow and many editor updates. Check the forum thread for a full list of upcoming changes, and we'd love to hear your feedback there. Do keep in mind that previews are intended only to provide a sample of what is going to be released in the update, and they are not production ready. Make a copy of your project for now. Recently, we caught up with the creators of Last Oasis, Donkey Crew. Starting as a modest modding team, they've grown into a 30-person studio and are leveraging their experience to reinvent the survival genre with an MMO experience. They share how they came up with the nomadic survival MMO concept, how they're building over 100 kilometer squared worlds, and how they came up with such a unique setting by both looking at the past and the future. Read more about Last Oasis and watch for its release in September. Starting today, we're making changes to how we label the status of new UE features. Moving forward, the term early access will be retired and replaced with beta to help avoid confusion about their meanings. Briefly, features in beta give you the opportunity to test content, but we also support backwards compatibility and the APIs for these are stable. Experimental features are exactly that, experimental. We'd love feedback on them, but the APIs are subject to change and we don't guarantee backwards compatibility and functionality or the entire feature may be removed. Operating with the motto, by enthusiasts, for enthusiasts, Dovetail Games dives into the subtleties and details of topics ranging from fishing to trains in order to create digital hobbies that are enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of fans across the globe. In the midst of explosive studio growth with the newly announced Train Sim World 2020 on the horizon and Fishing Sim World Pro Tour launching, we visited the team at its new headquarters where we're able to learn more about its principles and products while discovering the role Unreal Engine plays in bringing them both to life. Read our full interview to hear all about it. In the latest Virtual Disruptors podcast, part cinematographer, part game developer, part previs expert, and 100% creative, Matt Workman talks about his innovative new Unreal Engine-based product, Cinetracer. He discusses how he's designed the realistic cinematography simulator to be accessible to non-3D users, what it brings to virtual production workflows, and how he sees it developing in the future as hardware and engine technology evolve. Listen to the full podcast or read our overview on the blog. And just a reminder, our cinematic summer is still going strong. We encourage you to create a cinematic short inspired by summer. We've partnered with DX Racer once again to offer their snazzy UE branded chairs. Submissions are due by July 26th. And on to this week's top karma earners. Thank you to DPTD, Shadow River, T Sumisaki, Presmag2222, Garner P57, Daniel Orchard, Barrio Dole, Every Nine, Your Downfall, and Shadow Knight LT. Want to see your name up here? Hop over to Answer Hub and help out your fellow devs. First up in our community spotlight is a beautiful Office ArchViz project made by Gherkin Kaliskan. It clearly visualizes what the environment would look like when in use by the hypothetical tenants. It's a beautiful scene, great, great work. Next up is The Sitter, an upcoming new horror game being developed by Sajawa Production. We don't know much about the story, but be advised, the trailer and the game is not for the faint of heart. And our last spotlight this week is Sacred Siren, a psychedelic VR experience created by NanoShrine. Produced for Swim Soul's debut album, Goddess, it can be downloaded from itch.io right now. Thanks for joining us for this week's news and community spotlight. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Unreal Engine livestream. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and with me today I have Ben Mears, Games Community Manager at SideFX as well as Paul Ambrosius, and technical artist. And we are here today to talk a little bit about all the work that you, as well as your, your, your suite of tools, known as Houdini, um, helped shape some of the world, as well as a couple of other uh, pipeline and workflow improvements that you did for, uh, for Quixel and us when, we, uh, when Quixel produced um, Rebirth. And so welcome to the stream. I think uh, Ben Mears is going to uh, kick this off. Hey, Victor. 
Thanks for having us. Um, always great to be on the Unreal Engine live stream. Always a pleasure. Um, I'm going to get through some stuff real quick and let Paul get to the cool presentation. Uh, so game jam stuff first. Um, SideFX is sponsoring a couple game jams. I'm sure a lot of the viewers probably already know about UE4 Jam, and SideFX is sponsoring summer UE4 Jam, and I think that'll be announced pretty soon. Another game jam we're sponsoring, uh, this is the first time we're sponsoring this one, is Extra Credits Game Jam. Um, and that, I think, will be announced on Monday. And for both of those game jams, game jammers can get uh, temporary Houdini Indie licenses to use for the game jam. So find the details for that and request your license. A uh, couple other things coming up. We have SIGGRAPH here in LA. Uh, side effects has a big presence there. We do what we call Houdini Hive, which is three days of Houdini presentations. A lot of cool stuff being covered. Some of it's game related. A lot of it's film, film and TV because that's more kind of what SIGGRAPH is about. But uh, really cool stuff going on there. LA Houdini User Group is throwing a party at SIGGRAPH, uh, and anybody's welcome to come. So find the LA Houdini User Group on Eventbrite and register there. And then also Unreal Engine is having a user group uh, meetup at SIGGRAPH that I will be attending. So if anybody's going to be going to the Unreal meetup at SIGGRAPH, uh, find me. I'm, I'll be wearing lots of Houdini stuff. Um, one other event is uh, coming up in about a month is Gamescom. And I will be at Gamescom. Anybody who uh, is going to Gamescom and wants to meet up, talk about Houdini, let me know. And we could arrange a meeting there. Um, and as always, I always want to see Houdini and Unreal projects. So if you're making games using Houdini, get a hold of me, show me your stuff. You know, no matter if it's a game jam game, prototype, whatever, I want to check it out. And uh, with that, uh, we can kick it over to Paul. I should also note that we have a few uh, side effects tech artists and developers in the chat. We got Mike, Louise, and Damien in there. And they're going to be answering some of your questions. So put questions in the chat. And I think now we could kick it over to Paul for the Rebirth presentation. Nice. Thank you, Ben. And yeah, to let everyone know, Ben mentioned the Game Jam. We will be kicking that off on the 8th of August. Um, mm -hmm. Announcement is going to happen happen next week, but the date's locked down, so if you're planning to do it. Um, and we will open up uh, access to um, for you to be able to use Houdini over the Game Jam to give you a, you know, a, a week or two, actually, almost, so that you can get a little bit familiar with the tool um, if you'd like to use it during the Jam. Cool. Thanks a lot, Ben. Yeah, thank you. All right, over over to Paul. Or over to yeah, Paul. cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, thank you for everyone that's joining, listening on the live stream, or watching it after the fact. And uh, thank you as well to Epic and Unreal Engine team for uh, for having us today, so we can uh, talk about how Houdini was used in the awesome Rebirth cinematic uh, produced by Quixel. Um, like Ben said, in the chat, we have Mike, Louise, Damien, and Ben, so they can uh, answer any uh, Houdini questions that come up. And then later on, at the end of the presentation, uh, we also have time to uh, cover lots of questions that you might have. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's start. Uh, so to begin with, not directly jumping into Rebirth, I just want to briefly mention that uh, this is actually not the first time that we did a project for GDC together with Quixel. Last year, uh, we built a game called Brimstone. Uh, and this was, one, like I said, a Quixel on SideFX um, project. It was led by SideFX and was um, assisted by Quixel, Victor in this case, uh, with all the art and all the uh, uh, building of the levels. And the link that you see on the slides is uh, a link to all the talks that came out of this presentation, so, which is why I mainly wanted to mention this. It shows how you can use uh, Megascans assets together with Houdini to build awesome uh, games or cinematics or anything else you want for Unreal Engine. And this year, of course, Quixel led and we helped. And that's what we're talking about today. Uh, so this project, Rebirth, once again, a huge collaboration between Quixel, built in a bit for visual development, Ember Lab, uh, music, audio, narrative, and side effects. Uh, so let's just quickly take a look at the uh, cinematic so that uh, we all know what it is and we've all seen it. I'm sure you've seen it before, but uh, just to, uh, to play it, we'll play it right now.
adaptation. The ability to learn from past experience. The use of knowledge to alter their environment. These virtues defined our creators and drove them to the brink of destruction. But we cannot exist without them. We must save her. within us. Humanity has always had the potential to recognize its flaws and choose a better way. Can we save humanity? Was bringing her here the right choice? Mentioned in chat too. I can watch that every stream. <laughs> yeah. Don't mind it. Wish I had audio because I know the audio is really good too, but I can do that in the, after the stream. Cool. We're back. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, so that was the, uh, the cinematic. Um, so last week, uh, you guys had uh, Quixel on the stream. We had uh, Gail and Davis uh, talk about all the cool stuff on the production side of things and the pre production and so forth. Uh, but today we'll talk about the contribution that uh, SideFX Houdini did. So I have the honor to present the work that the SideFX Games team uh, did together on this project. Uh, so first, let's just quickly talk about what Houdini is. Uh, so we're all on the same page. So Houdini is an advanced procedural modeling, animation, effects, simulation, rendering, and compositing package. So it has a wide array of things you can do with it. Uh, and the most important thing is that Houdini's power is based on procedural workflows. So uh, working in Houdini involves creating networks of nodes, similar to like uh, working with blueprints inside of Unreal that you connect together to basically um, a complete or do a task that describes uh, what the computer, or in this case, Houdini needs to do to accomplish a task. So these operations or procedures, if you will, uh, together give you a very powerful toolkit. So at any given time, you can uh, go back basically in history and modify any of the nodes before the final note. So as you can see here, after the pipes have already been uh, laid out, I can always go back and, and modify the initial curve that was generated as sort of like the skeleton for the pipe. Uh, and this is something that you can't just do inside of Houdini. You can actually also do this inside of um, Unreal with the Houdini engine, which we'll talk about later. So basically what it comes down to, uh, Houdini is all node-based. It's self-contained, modular, great for pipelines, right? So you can author cool tools and, and, and uh, workflows in Houdini, make notes of them, and share them with other people, basically like uh, functions instead of Unreal. OK, so now we've seen somewhat more of a, a programmer art version of Houdini assets. Uh, next up, I'm going to show you uh, some examples made by Rush VFX. So as we can see here, um, all these different assets that you have, they're not just you know, modeled once and then they're static as is. These are all live smart assets, right? Who do you need digital assets? Meaning that uh, all of the, the properties that define what an object is, like for example, uh, the width of it, the height of it, and all the, the, the base shapes, you can always go back and, and modify these with sliders, basically letting you build an infinite amount of variations of that uh, prop that you have. So shout out to Rush VFX uh, for this video. Um, if you want to see the full breakdown, uh, you can go to the Vimeo link um, shown at the bottom of the slides. So um, like mentioned before, um, the artist team that was actually assembling the scenes instead of Unreal was really small, uh, three people. Uh, but the Houdini team was up actually also very small. Uh, so at the top, we see uh, Richard from Quixel. 
Uh, Richard is Quixel's internal Houdini champion, working on all the internal Houdini pipelines they have. And then uh, we have Luis, Mike, and myself um, from the side effects team, um, which is all about the breakdown we're showing here today. Uh, but besides that, uh, the person not credited here is Damien, uh, who is a developer building the Houdini Engine plugin for Unreal. So I also want to thank him uh, for the support he gave us during the project and uh, just a general shout out to him. As for the uh, cinematic team, uh, like I mentioned before, three artists from Quixel. Um, side effects, like the, the three uh, tool developers, we did not build any of the shots that you saw during the cinematic, right? That was all the work of the fantastic Quixel art team on the project. Um, and without these awesome artists, tools you know, are, are pretty useless. Like they, they don't do anything. So you need awesome artists to build cool uh, content with, right? And uh, without them, it wouldn't have been as successful. So the things we'll be talking about today are uh, effects, mesh processing, terrain, world building, and the mega structure detailing. Uh, for the effects, um, I took some of the questions that were asked last week um, about the uh, the fog. So I, I made some videos to show how that actually works inside of Unreal. So the effects, uh, people said that uh, it used lots of you know magic tricks and and all sorts of you know weird things, but it was actually pretty straightforward what we did with uh, Houdini and uh, Unreal. So all the fog that you see, or most of the fog, is really just cards with uh, texture sheets on them. So in a couple of slides, we'll show how those texture sheets got made. And of course, also some of these stock actors that uh, Unreal ships for fog, like for example, exponential fog. So uh, here we have a video of, fog, of you know, an example of fog. So to generate the fog uh, before any of the, the rendering inside of Unreal, uh, we decided not to generate these kind of cards with simulations inside of Houdini, not because it couldn't do that, of course not, because Houdini is awesome at doing that, but because the artists that I mentioned before didn't really have any effects experience, especially not doing effects inside of Houdini. So if we were to have them have to teach them how to use these, uh, you know, for example, a smoke solver or a pyro solver inside of Houdini, that would have taken, you know, a couple of weeks maybe, uh, which is time that we really did not have for this project. Uh, so it would really hard for them to art direct a simulation. You know, they could get it working and get something cool, but not uh, something that would look exactly the way that the art direction of this project required. Uh, so really, all the fog is in this project is just evolving fog on a flipbook. And how we got there didn't really matter. So the approach that we took is really cool. So here's the, an actual um, render of what was used in game. Uh, so once again, side effects built the tool, right? That allowed you to really easily tweak all these things. And then the artists at Quixel, they uh, took those tools, ran off with it, and were able to create these cool looking results without having any effects experience, right? But they were still able to achieve the look that they wanted for a project. So how did that work? Um, we came up with a solution where we have multiple levels of noise at a lower resolution. Uh, to very quickly get your main shapes and you know define an overall look you see here and then we can blend between those right at a coarse level which means that uh, you wouldn't get any small islands of fog floating around if you were to multiply more of a high resolution fog uh, which you would do which you would get if you were to do that in shadering engine then what we did is we um we faded out the volume around the, the bounds of uh, of the frame that's being rendered so you can see the square on the screen and uh, then lastly, we affected it with higher frequency noise, giving us this really sharp, um, sharper look of the fog, which is more you know, towards the direction that they wanted. And since this is just you know, uh, noise that we're multiplying inside of Houdini, this was really, uh, really fast to tweak, uh, almost real time, which means that the artists were able to get more iterations out and therefore more variation and therefore in the end, a higher uh, quality end result. Um, so that's that. And so the texture sheets that I mentioned, uh, I think we used a maximum of five or six unique ones for the entire cinematic. And here we see uh, four of them. So how does this work? Uh, you can see that there are basically eight times eight unique images on, uh, on one of these sheets. And what it does in the shader is it basically just takes one of these squares and then for every frame, it moves to the next one giving you the illusion that it's, you know, it's evolving, it's a live video, even though it's actually just frames playing by, right? And then together with, uh, you know, cool blending tricks inside the shader and some uh, subscattering, 
you get something that looks really great, uh, which is what we can see here on, uh, on this slide. Uh, so this is stuttering, as you can see, uh, but this is just a raw texture sheet, right? So moving from one frame uh, to the next without any blending. And uh, we've also made the fog somewhat more dense than it is in the real deal. Uh, so it's easier to see for this uh, breakdown. And then here is the, the actual final uh, video used in the cinematic. So as you can see, it's nice and smooth, it's less dense, and it looks a, a lot better overall. So to actually prove that it's cars and it's not some stuff I'm making up, I made this video inside of the uh, Unreal Editor. So in the World Outliner, I just typed Steam uh, because we call it these cards Steam cards. And as you can see, it's literally just a plane with a material on there uh, with lots of um, uh, parameters to tweak, like for example, the emission, how emissive is the fog, you know, it becomes a lot brighter when you turn up the emission, uh, the speed and so forth. And as you saw, I moved towards the card just to show you that, yes, indeed, it is a flat 2D thing. And then now I'll actually also show you um, how that looked like uh, in the end. So here we have sequencer, and then I click in or lock into the camera that we use for rendering. And there we go. We can see that it is those cards that I just showed you. Uh, so that was the uh, the biggest, uh, most noteworthy part of effects that we did for uh, for Quixel. Next up, we'll talk about asset processing, and I think that this is one of the most important things that we helped with, because of course, if everything comes from mega scans, you know, there's lots of geometry to process uh, before it can go uh, straight into Unreal. Uh, so that's what I'll show you. So the first type of processing that we did is actually generating level of details. Um, you might ask why level of details for a cinematic? Uh, well, the final renders in a cinematic, you know, they're using cinematic quality LODs, right? So that's the, that's the 300,000 polygons per rock kind of thing. But if you have an entire scene with, let's say, hundreds or thousands of rocks even assembled together, if you multiply that by 300,000 uh, polygons, that's going to get really slow. Uh, meaning it would cost more time, and time is something we did not have for the project. So with these LODs of, let's say, the, the one that you see all the way in the bottom right of 10K, that's the proxy geometry that we use to actually assemble the scene and get an overall look of how we want it to look, right? Which meant that it's nice and light, along for fast iteration speeds. And then once uh, you know everything was assembled the way that we wanted, it looked great, then you can just uh, switch the to toggle and say, you know, for the rendering, use the cinematic LODs. Uh, which is you know really easy. Uh, another important piece is the uh, the car. So this was a concept rendering from uh, Fausto De Martini. Uh, it's a car that got modeled in an extremely high resolution mesh, uh, which of course had to be decimated before we could um, you know bring it into Unreal for real time rendering. And here we see that same car from uh, from another angle. So as you can see, it has you know lots of detail. It's a really high res mesh, which we uh, decimated using Houdini. So here we see that uh, car inside of uh, the editor and the, um, the mesh in the bottom right, and of course the UVs that come with it. So since uh, the car just needed to be decimated and was not really the centerpiece of the thing we wanted to show, it's still an important piece, but not the centerpiece, we decided not to spend too much time manually uh, retopoing the car uh, to quad geometry. Uh, because, you know, for a simple uh, poly reduction and a bake, you don't really need that if it's not a, a centerpiece or something that's going to get animated or rigged. So since Houdini makes these things really easy, the decimation, UVing, and the baking, all procedural, uh, we decided that this was a really good way to proceed. So what you see here on the right is seven nodes, uh, even though you really only need five. That's all you really need in Houdini to get a clean decimated uh, geometry with UVs. So at the top, we can see a file node. Uh, the file node, all it originally does is just imports a file from disk. So an FBX, an OBJ file, uh, and lots of other uh, formats that we support. Then we have this access align sop. What it does is it just automatically centers the object in the middle of the, uh, the origin. It scales it to the right size uh, just by taking a, a checkbox. Uh, then what it does is we have a voxel mesh node, which just takes any type of geometry as long as it's closed and it converts it to a volume, a really high resolution volume, and then converts it back to geometry. The reason we do this is to prevent any you know, garbage, bad geometry that you might have in your geometry from, let's say, a CAD mesh or anywhere else uh, to prevent the decimation process from creating a clean uh, triangle mesh, right? 
And that's what the next uh, node does, the polyreduce node. On the polyreduce node, you can literally tell Houdini, take this, this mesh from any, you know, any poly count and bring it down to, let's say, 30,000 or 10,000 or whatever you want. Or give me, you know, 1% of the number of uh, polygons that you have. As you can see, it says reduce to 0.20%, uh, you know, which is a huge reduction. You set the normals, you know, make sure that the normals look great again. And then you plug it into the auto UV node, which just automatically unwraps it to the UVs that we saw before. And then we stash it, which is just, you know, the mesh that we can output output to uh, to Unreal. Uh, I also quickly wanted to show you how the baking would look like in Houdini. So just a disclaimer, we did not do any baking for this car, uh, for this project. But just to show you how easy it is to do this kind of baking, uh, I dropped down a baking node to show you. You just plug in your low poly on the left side and your high poly on the right side, hit bake, and you have your textures. So to show that in action, I just wanted to show you, uh, you know, a baking process happening. So on the left side, we can see that, you know, we have our low poly mesh, which is 10,000 or 11,000 polygons. And in the middle, we have one with two and a half million polygons. And with baking, you're essentially uh, taking the high resolution mesh, taking all the details, its normals, and baking that down to a texture on a low poly mesh, right? So how fast is that in Houdini? I'm going to show you. So I'm going to bake a 4K normal map uh, of the meshes you saw before. So I'm going to click the bake button now and you will see a pop-up that shows seconds timer, three, four, five, and it will take approximately nine seconds for this mesh. And in nine seconds, we already uh, rendered a 4K normal map, you know, which is super awesome. Once again, the faster your processing speeds are, uh, the faster you can iterate, meaning in more time for creativity, really unlocking the capabilities that an artist might have. Uh, another cool tool that we built, or a pipeline rather, is a, something we called Polycruncher, I believe, for this uh, project. You could just tell it to uh, bring in a mesh or a library of files, and it would also import uh, a texture, which was, had a fuzz map, which basically showed where there was moss on the geometry. It hardened all the normals and smoothed the regions where there was moss. Then it automatically spit out uh, LODs, right? LOD 0, LOD 1, LOD 2, you know, the cinematic level, the game res uh, model, and the block art proxy model. And also, <clears throat> also channel packing these textures together. So every single asset had basically a displacement map, a roughness map, and a couple of other maps you can see here, which it just combined together. So for example, the roughness map went into the red channel, something else went into the blue channel, and something else went into the green channel. And if you have to do that for over 100 plus meshes, which is what this project had, which each have, you know, three to five textures per mesh, that becomes something that is, you know, not fun to do. So imagine being an artist and someone tells you, okay, you know, starting tomorrow, you will have to, you know, uh, create LODs by hand and channel pack textures for over 100 meshes. You're going to become really demotivated and, you know, bored with what you're doing. Uh, so all the assets in the Megascans pipeline for this project went through this tool. Um, so how long did it take to build a tool like this? Um, so I talked together with Owen, uh, the artist who was going to use this to process all the tools, and we spent around an hour and a half um, uh, for the final tool, right? And that included brainstorming with the artist. So initially, uh, we did a call with Owen. We talked about what is it you need, you know, what are the things you want to be able to tweak, what are the things you want to be automated, and then we just built it. So within an hour and a half, approximately, we had this tool that we could just give to Pixel and say, there you go, you can you know, process your entire library. And instead of it taking a week or more than that to process everything, it just took a matter of hours, which meant that as soon as something was done, it just ran through the pipeline in something like 30 seconds, and it was done, ready for usage in Unreal. So this meant that the artists were more motivated and had more time for creativity, once again, uh, letting the artists do their thing, right? Being artsy inside of Unreal, uh, unlocking their full artistic capabilities. Um, next up, let's talk about world building and terrain, since we had uh, a lot of questions there as well. Uh, so a big important tool that allowed us to basically uh, merge these sort of cliff uh, assemblies from mega scans, right? These rocks that were all packed together in sort of like a cliff looking shape with the landscape we wanted to remove any hard intersections between it. So if you have, let's say, a flat plane and you intersect it with a rock, you might get a really hard intersection between that, which doesn't look good because you know you want your normals to be nice and smooth, 
and in real life, you know, you would have dirt building up there. So what you see here in this video is a tool that just takes a landscape, you know, crops a small region out of it, so it's faster to work with inside of Unreal. It takes in the uh, cliff assembly from the artist that they placed, and then what it does is it automatically, you know, generates this build up that you see, and then once it's done that, it actually runs an erosion simulation inside of Unreal using Houdini Engine to create these nice flow lines along the, the rocks so that, you know, in the end, once you apply all the shaders and all the textures, you would see the moss actually growing where it should grow instead of just, you know, being placed by a noise mask or something else like that. So this is all happening inside of Unreal. In the end, we uh, ended up not using this approach because uh, we decided to go with uh, static meshes for the landscape because it allowed us to do more things like photics painting and so forth and a higher resolution mesh overall. Uh, but this is still a really useful tool, you know, that we're uh, publishing um, for other uses. So if you already have Houdini and you downloaded the game development tool set, you can get this tool, it's called Dirt Skirt. So the thing I just showed you, what are the steps it's doing? Um, you have your initial terrain and your mesh. So the red part here in the top left is your mesh. You then project your uh, height field or landscape up to the rock. So we can see that now we have sort of, you know, a shape that sort of what somewhat looks like the rocks. We mask the region of where the rocks are in the part that we just projected up. And then we just smooth it, like you can see here, so that we have these nice, round, soft um, blends happening between the rock and the terrain. And then we generate the flow maps. Okay, so the flow maps are basically just an erosion simulation that we run. And the, the only thing we really grab from that is these sort of flow lines, which we then multiply with our mask that we had before, giving us this nicely eroded uh, look that has no hard intersections with the rocks. And then together with the rocks, we can see that, you know, this looks really smooth compared to here. Um, so how does it look like inside of the engine? Uh, this is the comparison. Um, it's really hard to see which is which because we're quite far away. So uh, we've highlighted the region where uh, the things have changed. For this project, like I said, we didn't end up using it because we went with uh, meshes for landscapes and we didn't really have any shots that had these sort of cliff assemblies really close to camera. Uh, but if you have a game where, for example, you know, people are walking all the way up to these rocks in a more you know, real-time environment where players can walk around, this really makes a big deal. Um, of the quality of your, your game overall. So as for the actual terrain, uh, what you saw before was just, you know, the, um, the assembly or combination of rocks on the terrain. We, of course, also needed to create the actual terrain itself. So Icelandic terrain is very unusual if you uh, look at it. It has lots of unique elements to it uh, if you look at it for a while. Uh, so we couldn't just use any of the generic erosion solvers out there uh, on the market. Uh, because they were simply not up to the task. Same goes with Houdini. If we just use the, uh, the default erosion solver that it came with without any tweaking or customization, it didn't really achieve the art directed look that um, the art directors were acquiring for this project. So what we started with is actually going to uh, open to topography to download uh, digital elevation maps from there. Okay? So we just sourced a real world location for realistic mountains and hills that were assembled and uh, further processed inside of Houdini with erosion and so forth. So these uh, digital elevation maps, essentially just height maps, are accurate to around 50 centimeters, right, per pixel. Uh, it's also completely open source. And if you want to find the locations that we used uh, for the project, it's actually in Alaska, it's not in Iceland, spoiler, uh, you can find them at this uh, location if you want to try and replicate this yourself. Uh, so, like I said, after doing some basic erosion tests with the stock Houdini nodes, uh, we resulted with this. It, you know, sort of looked okay, but it did not really uh, match the reference that we had received from the Quixel art team uh, for the tool or the tool set that we wanted to build for them. And it was pretty difficult for us to precisely pinpoint what exactly made Icelandic terrain look like Icelandic terrain. Initially, you can see it, and you know, you can, you know, make some sculpts with noise and so forth in Houdini or anywhere else. And you'll get something like this, but it's not exactly Icelandic terrain. So when we looked closer at Icelandic terrain, is that, is that we saw that um, the ridges and valleys of all these hills and mountains actually had lots of erosion happening on just those two parts and not a lot on the body, so the parts in between those two. Kind of like lava that's flowing through there, right? Eroding the tops and the, the bottom parts. 
and the artist would need to have a, a controls over where this erosion needed to happen. So we would we built tools that automatically mask these regions for them. So they would just need to play with some sliders uh, and masking some things uh, by hand if they wanted to, uh, to have the erosion happen where they wanted it to. Because once again, the erosion happening on the terrain was definitely not in a uniform distribution throughout the landscape. So once again, building this with stock nodes in Houdini didn't quite do it for us. But since Houdini, everything is uh, built with nodes and you can dive inside, we were actually able to modify the erosion solver uh, to get it somewhat closer to what we wanted it, which is a very powerful thing, right? So uh, here are some more uh, work in progress shots where we kept getting closer and closer to the target that we had in mind, uh, which, is the which is the time step where uh, we felt comfortable enough bringing these meshes, uh, like I said before, we used meshes in Unreal, uh, to bring this inside of Unreal for assembly, right? So we already knew these were all the kind of masks that we can use inside the, um, the landscape uh, material, right? We have the moss layer, we have the debris layer, we have the flow map layer and all that kind of stuff, which we then were able to um, multiply or assemble with all the mega scans textures that the Quixel team um, gave the art team, which gave them uh, you know, something that we see here in the bottom right, which then later of course was uh, refined more and more. It was really important to do this as soon as possible because the terrain and landscape was almost in every single shot of the cinematic, if not in every shot, right? So the sooner we were able to test this workflow and get the artist, you know, something in their hand to play with, the better the final quality would be. So once we had, you know, that R&D part figured out, you know, um, we built the tools for the Quixel artist to play in Houdini to build these uh, erosions and so forth, looked good. We gave it to the art, art team, right? So Owen took um, these tools that we built for him, the workflows, disassembled it and reassembled it uh, to work the way he wanted, which then allowed him to build these really cool um, initial tests that he did uh, to test whether or not you know, it would work. Uh, yeah, so this was, this was really cool. Uh, so to see the meshes inside of Unreal, which I think hasn't been shown before, is as you can see, it's literally just a mesh. It's not a landscape actor. And every single mountain or hill or whatever else in, in the project that wasn't very unique was just one of these hero pieces, right? So inside of Houdini, we built you know, a couple of these hero pieces, which then were reassembled inside of uh, Unreal to create these nice assemblies of uh, a mountain range. Um, as you can see, if we rotate the terrain around, all the textures are actually world space, uh, using world space UVs, meaning that if you were to move a mesh around and intersect it with something else, you wouldn't get any disconnect between, let's say, the moss texture from one mesh to another. Like again, all the mountains were made using this approach, except for the unique ones. The unique ones is the thing that I'm going to show next, uh, one of which was this shot. The shot looks uh, pretty straightforward. We thought that we were able to build this using the tools that we already gave the Quixel artist. Um, but we pretty quickly found out that this was a really tricky shot. You know, we had uh, our concept art, which is what you see here, and it had a very distinct look. We have these three hills here, right? And if you look closer at it, it's actually harder to do than it looks. Try controlling noise to try and do that. So initially, Owen, the artist who was uh, starting with this shot, he tried starting with a slope we see here, applying moist noise to it uh, to get these three hills. You can get something that looks close, but we wanted something that looks exactly like the art directed piece, right? So once again, we took the procedural tools in Houdini and gave them you know, some controls that allowed for more art directable um, work to be applied, right? So how did that work? This is the actual network or Houdini file used for this, for this particular scene. And all it literally is, is just three cones which the artist can you know, move around, project that onto a height field, which is what we call in Houdini, and then some transform nodes, which allows us to basically just play God and move these mountains around to wherever um, the artist wants them to be, right? And this makes it really, really easy to composite these mountains together to get it to look one-to-one -one with the, um, the, the concept art that uh, Beauty in a Bit created. So this is, uh, yeah, this is all Owen doing his cool magic work. And then here uh, we can see the actual final thing that was used in the cinematic 
once again, it's just exported as a mesh. We exported out all the uh, the mask for the moss and the flow maps and all the debris and all the rock and so forth, which is then um, what gave us this. So this is the final shot inside of uh, Unreal with everything applied. So the geometry, shaders, textures, and so forth, which then if we compare it to the initial concept art, we can see that it's really, really close, right? So the top left is the concept art. And here in the bottom right, we can see the um, uh, the final shot. So once again, people say, yes, Houdini is a very procedural tool. You can do lots of things with noise, math, and other cool stuff. But you can actually also art direct anything as much as you want, right? So Houdini allows you to make it as procedural as you want or not as procedural as you want, right? As manual as you would like. And that makes Houdini a really powerful piece of software to do these really cool landscapes or geometry or anything else for Unreal Engine. Um, next for world building is uh, things like foliage. Um, and for foliage, we use the uh, Houdini tool called Pivot Painter. And to explain what Pivot Painter is, I uh, got these um, these GIFs from uh, Pezit. Uh, thank you to him. You can follow him on Twitter on Deep Space Banana, uh, which just shows what it is. So essentially, what you're doing is for every single polygon or every single vertex in your mesh, you're encoding what the pivot point has to be in world space, right? So for example, if you have a plant or a tree, instead of just exporting out the tree as a whole uh, or separating everything, like you know, a unique mesh per branch or per leaf and so forth, you can actually just export one tree where every single vertex knows where its sub-object has its pivot located. So for a branch, for example, every single vertex inside of a branch knows where its pivot has to be meaning you can rotate or modify or anything else you want to do in shader to make it look organic or create a really cool sci-fi looking effect you see here. And all you really need to do in Houdini is have your geometry, uh, create something called a name attribute, have some pivot points, and it will automatically encode all of that information into the geometry, which then means that inside of Unreal, inside of the uh, material editor, you can grab that data using the pivot painter nodes and tell it for every single vertex, give me the x-axis, so, you know, the direction it's facing, or the pivot point location, meaning that you know you can rotate or do anything else like you see here by just modifying the world position offset. So really lightweight, cool shader trick, which is pretty old. So what did we use it for on the project? Well, we used it for all the foliage initially. Um, so we can see here that you know we built a tool for Quixel that automatically figures out where the pivot points are for every single strand of, of, of uh, grass or every leaf of a plant, and then you know be able to mask it, the motion mask, so we could very easily control which parts of the mesh that we want to have you know lots of motion, and which parts of the mesh that we not to have a lot of motion. So that's the the black and white color you see here on the uh, the mesh when I'm playing with these sliders. So as you can see, the, the, the core of the plant is really dark. You don't expect any movement happening there from wind, but the outsides or the parts lying on the floor, you might not want to have wind or you might want to have wind. So this, what you see here is, you know, initial test that I did uh, for them before handing it over to them. And then once you hand over a tool uh, that works for you, you know, an artist comes back and says, hey, it doesn't work for me, uh, which is, you know, what produced these, uh, these weird looking but funny looking effects. Uh, so something went wrong there. We did debugging, lots of back and forth to get the tool working. See here, we have an even more aggressive version of that, which then in the end, you know, resulted in something that looked closer and closer to what they wanted. And here we see a shot um, uh, closer to, you know, the deadline. This shot is actually not the shot used in the final cinematic. I picked this shot because it has more of the grass shown. In the end, the final shot maybe has, you know, one or two blades of grass moving, um, might not seem important, but it's still an important part. It makes the scene look a lot more um, natural and alive, right? Uh, next up is uh, the megastructure detailing. So uh, the megastructure, you know, is a really, really big piece of the project for the Quixel project uh, because it simply has so much detail packed into it and it's such an important piece in the, the final shot of the uh, cinematic. So the artist uh, who's Victor from Quixel, he's in charge of uh, both building this uh, mega structure and art directing it. And he told us that you know this would take a really, really long uh, time to build this, which would meant that uh, it would take a large chunk of his time on the project, 
meaning you could spend less time on other shots, which is of course something you don't want. You want to have as much time as possible on every single shot to get a really high quality looking um, cinematic. So instead of building all of this by hand, we decided to give a give uh, Houdini a try on, on building these cool uh, tools that would give you this scribble to prevent any labor intensive uh, work from happening for the artist. Uh, we didn't actually initially start uh, with building this scribble or this sci-fi paneling in Houdini. So what you see here is what uh, Victor already made before we you know, built this tool for Houdini. And he said, you know, it, it just takes way too long. And uh, can't we, you know, develop a tool that, you know, does the rest of the paneling for all these other, these other grids, which, you know, would take a really long time. So we said, uh, yes, we can do that. We'll work on a tool. So what we started out with is uh, just using uh, the default noise algorithms we have in Houdini. I think this noise algorithm is called uh, Cherbyshev. Um, I'll probably be corrected afterwards. Uh, but it, you know, gave us something that looked like this. But Victor uh, stepped in and said, you know, that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, this is not the thing that I, I want. Um, I would like it to be more like this. I like this, these parts of what you've created so far. I don't quite like this. Can you try and do this instead? Which was really helpful for us because um, that allowed us to really iterate upon the tool that built this, uh, giving us something that looked exactly the way uh, Victor wanted in the end. So how did it work? Um, instead of using noises, we decided to just build a solution from scratch, uh, which is something we call lot subdivision, which essentially is just taking the uh, the main primitive that you have, right, so the big panel, which hasn't been cut up yet, and you just cut it through the middle, straight through the middle on its longest side. So if you have a long, thin piece, you would cut it into two, you know, less long pieces uh, or change where you want to cut it to create some variation, right? To give you a variation of thicker and thinner pieces inside of those polygons. And then you reiterate that process for every single piece that you cut. So imagine cutting a piece of paper into two and then cutting the pieces of paper in two again and then in two again and two again. So that expon exponentially grows with the number of pieces, giving you lots and lots of tiny small pieces, which is not what we wanted. So after you've cut them down into small tiny pieces, we just did like a loop over all of these and clustered them together based on lots of metrics like position and connectivity and so forth, giving you these nice irregular uh, sci-fi looking uh, panels. Uh, it's great for doing sci-fi kind of things, but it's actually also really useful for uh, city generation where you know this could be the building profile for a building, really great starting point. Uh, this tool is not you know hidden. We've actually published this tool for free, so you can grab it from the game development tool set inside of Houdini. It's called Lot Subdivision. It you know, might look a bit different from what is here because it's an earlier stage, but the final thing works really great. Um, so yeah, uh, we took the tool that we made on the uh, previous slide and we applied that to the actual building, uh, which gave us you know, this, this version here, which we sent to Victor and he said, you know, now's the time to actually start playing around with it. Uh, so he did that, and uh, here we see, you know, a comparison between the uh, the thing that Victor made by hand and the parts that we created uh, using Houdini. So you might spot some differences there. For example, one of which is, you know, this guy here has all sorts of pipes in between, and this is just black. We did not build that yet, right? So we're just focusing on the the panels for now. Uh, so this tool or workflow is a really good example of how you can take something that an artist has made, you know, they've crafted a certain style or a certain uh, look, and then you convert that into a more procedural solution, meaning that you can now take that handcrafted look and apply that to a larger set of data. So instead of, you know, having one piece of hard, uh, handcrafted piece, we can now create hundreds or thousands of these handcrafted pieces using Houdini. Um, and then since it's all procedurally driven using parameters, um, you have something called a seed. And the seed is literally just a value that you can play around with. You can change it to, you know, two or to five or to five million. And every time you change that number, it gives you a different variation. So by just, you know, playing around with a slider, you can actually already create hundreds or thousands of these variations and then handpick the one that you like most and just say, this is the one I'm going to go with meaning that you as an artist using Houdini, you're not really building these kind of things anymore. You're becoming more of an art director telling Houdini, I like this, I don't like that, change this, change that, you know, can we do this instead? 
that's what an artist role is becoming inside of Houdini or inside of Unreal if you use Houdini Engine, right? Um, so Victor took the tool and then he uh, started playing around with it and he sent this screenshot to us where he said, you know, I'm happy with, um, with this output that the tool gave us. So once you have a happy artist uh, with a tool, quality will automatically follow. So uh, to show you the process that, you know, it would take to build these kind of panels, uh, we just made this quick video. So first you import your, uh, your mesh into uh, Houdini from Unreal. You then isolate a section. So let's say we want to do that particular panel. You plug it into the tool and then you can play with these parameters. For example, I want to have, you know, a rotation in this angle or in that angle. Uh, you can specify uh, how thick you want the borders to be between the panels, giving you, a, you know, more or less sci-fi look. The overall seed giving you variations, the thickness of it, and also uh, controlling, you know, procedurally vertex colors. The photo scholars were basically used for uh, creating variations of uh, materials inside of Unreal, meaning that you know if a photo scholar had red, it would use this texture. If it had green, it would use this texture, and so forth. Meaning that we didn't have to export out you know a unique mesh per object or with multiple material slots. We could just use the photo scholars to um, to create variations with it. So the tool you see here, um, again, this tool is called Soft Sci-Fi Panel. It's basically just a wrapper around the thing we saw before, the loss subdivision, giving, um, you know, exposing all of the, the extra things that Victor needed to do this, right? So the vertex colors and some other things that you've noticed here that weren't part of the loss subdivision. So you can get this for free, play with it, create cool stuff. Uh, let us and Quixel know that you like it or don't like it or any requests you have. Uh, and then, yeah, you can see here inside of the uh, the project that you know we can create light variations between um, between them. So, for example, you know, slightly offset the roughness or anything else like that, just to make it play nicely with the lighting. Uh, and then here we have that inside of uh, inside of the editor in Unreal. And then the final rendered shot. So, as you can see, lots and lots and lots of paneling here on this shot. Just this one shot, or all the shots, of course, right? This would have taken a really, really long time to do manually, which now you know we were just able to do procedurally. Um, so those were all the big kind of things that we did for uh, the project that were used in the project. Now I'm going to show you a couple of uh, experiments, or we consider them experiments. We planned out for those things to be used in the shots, but they might have ended up you know, not being used because we couldn't quite figure it out or because uh, shots that were using them got cut and so forth. So even though they're not used, they're still very, very valuable learning experiences or tools that you know, we've still published, which you can use in other projects. Because that's another great thing about Houdini. You can take any you know, pipeline or workflow that you uh, use for one project in Unreal, for example, you can grab that tool that you built and just use it in another project. It's not, you know, it's not locked down. It's procedural. You can always go back and modify the things that you you've built, right? So one of which uh, is is sort of piping or greebling that I showed you. So remember when I showed you the comparison between one of the uh, the shots where it was handcrafted, that had greebling and pipes in them, and the right one had just you know black squares behind them. So we tried and also automate that process of generating that greebling, uh, which seemed pretty straightforward. But very quickly, we ended up with you know, a sort of um, a path finding algorithm that would avoid obstacles that the artist could hand place, giving these sort of pipes. Um, but we showed that to, uh, to Victor and the artist. And they said, um, I don't think we need a procedural tool to do this, because um, I already made the greeble, right? I already made these sort of presets or, or uh, kits that I can uh, kit bash together. So I can just take those and, and put them behind the things that Houdini made. So what we learned from this is not everything needs to be procedural, right? Uh, this tool, for example, it didn't have as many use cases as, for example, uh, the, the paneling, right? The paneling would have been hundreds of thousands of pieces you'd have to do manually, even though this was maybe you know only 10 or 15. So that's a, a trade-off you have to find between when am I going to build a procedural solution for this and when am I going to just do it manually? So here we see, you know, uh, these uh, these pipes and this greeble that you know Victor already modeled, we could just take those, cut them out, and you know put them behind the Houdini panels, and it would just give you the same thing. So as you can see here, we have you know a, uh, a dozen panels that have been cut up, but only you know three or four of these greeble patterns. 
So this is not as it's not as important that this is procedural, but this part saves us a lot of time. Another cool thing that we did is uh, try and reverse engineer um, mudslides or, or the sliding of rocks over a terrain. So initially we had uh, quite a few shots actually in the cinematic plan where lots of these kind of rocks, in this case, it's just roughly you know, um, represented with uh, these spheres scattered on the terrain that we wanted to look embedded in the terrain, you know, give them sort of like a backstory. How did this rock get here? Why is it exactly there and so forth? So what we wanted to do is try and, and, and reverse engineer the history of a rock. So rocks don't just you know, magically spawn somewhere. They start up at a hill, for example, right? And then they slide down. And it gives you these sort of path that they carve in where you, know, you would have you know, more moss growing or you would have more debris or you know, it would look deeper, different sort of height there. Uh, so what we tried and, and do is just generate this automatically. Uh, so how did that work? We just started with these initial wide positions. And then inside of a solver in Houdini, we just basically did a simulation that for every single step, we generated these flow lines, which is something I've showed before, and calculated the slope at that particular position of the rock at that point, and then figured out what is the best path upwards of the hill, right? So instead of it just doing a physics simulation rolling down, for every single step, we just calculated or, or um, engineered a way for the rock to crawl up, which gives us these sort of you know, pipes or worms or snakes or whatever you want to call it that we can then use as you know, a sort of way to stamp it into um, the, the landscape, giving us what we want. So these are the, uh, the main experiments and, and cool things that I wanted to show you. Um, so we've seen you know, lots of Houdini use here which um, you can also use inside of Unreal Engine directly, right? So you don't need, as an artist at least, you don't directly need to work in Houdini. You can have something authored in Houdini, for example, the sci-fi paneling tool that we saw or um, you know, erosion or something else like that. And you can give that to a person who's just working inside of Unreal in the editor who is using something called Houdini Engine. So Houdini Engine takes these digital assets, these tools, and allows you in real time during editor time, right? So not during runtime, during editor time to play with these parameters, giving you the exact same controls you have in Houdini with some limitations, like for example, painting and so forth. But there are ways to mitigate that. So Houdini offer a tool once and in Houdini engine deploy many. So for example, you can have one artist who is uh, or artist or technical director or whoever else wants to use Houdini, build these procedural solutions he makes these tools, he creates you know, this parameter interface you saw with all these sliders that the artist can play with, stores that file and imports it into uh, Unreal. And then all the users inside of Unreal, they can take this and just utilize it as much as they want. So once again, author once, deploy many. Uh, so here's a, Here's a video of uh, that working. So here's a cool example, uh, courtesy of Magnus Larsen. So shout out to him. He basically just uh, created a tool that would import these sort of uh, concrete pillars. He could, you know, place a sphere that would cut out or break loose, you know, uh, concrete pieces. And then he had another tool that would automatically uh, generate uh, chains hanging between them. So as you can see, this is a really powerful tool, which you know doesn't really take long to build, where you can just, you know place these pillars and you would automatically create these, have these chains generated between them. And as soon as you move any of these pillars, the chains would automatically recook and reiterate um, the thing you've made, updating it to the final look. So what can you do with Houdini Engine and what are the limitations? Um, so for output, oh, let me just play this video. So for output, uh, Houdini Engine can output procedural geometry, so static meshes, it can also export out instancers, so uh, instance static meshes or hierarchical instance static meshes or overrides for actors and, and geometry. It can export out landscapes, so you can actually have the native uh, Unreal Engine landscape be written by Houdini Engine or modified by Houdini Engine even. It can also generate collision, so you know if you have this concrete pillar we see here, it could automatically generate collision around it so that you, know, you don't just have render geometry but you also have collision geometry so that you know, if a player walks into it, they wouldn't just walk through it, they would just walk up against it in, like you'd expect from a, uh, a pillow like this. It can also automatically generate LODs, which means that you, know, you can have a fully functional asset, smart asset essentially, right? Be generated inside of uh, Unreal, which you've built in Houdini. 
As for input meshes, uh, you can input meshes or skeletal meshes since recently from the content browser. You can also do it uh, from actors that are you know, instantiated in the world already. So in this video you see here, he just fed this already existing pillar or cube or whatever else it started with. And as soon as he moved it, you know, Houdini engine would know something has changed. I need to recoup this thing, giving him this updated look. You can also use uh, spline components. So for example, if you're building, let's say, a, a race a racetrack, a game inside of Unreal, you could have that be driven by a spline, right? Where you just place a spline and then uh, Houdini engine inside of Unreal will automatically generate the roads and all the, the, the fences around it. And even people, if you want to, like you saw in a video at the beginner, beginning, and you can, of course, also input landscapes and landscape layers. So the example that we showed before, where we had a rock assembly be input into the landscape to embed it, um, that is also something you can input, right? So here's my landscape, Houdini engine or Houdini, please modify it and give me an updated look. That's Houdini engine. So Houdini engine, um, what does it offer artists? Uh, so with artists, you can very quickly rebuild um, things that you've made, right? Recook things, change the parameters. You have a Houdini debugger. So if something doesn't quite work or you want to see how this thing works or why it isn't working, you can just open up Houdini as a live session and you can see how uh, Houdini and Unreal Engine work together. You can pause cooking, continue cooking so it doesn't you know, freeze your editor uh, while you're processing you know, an entire scene at once or an entire game at once if you wanted to. It gives you a tool shelf. So if you build any uh, tools using Houdini yourself, you can just grab those tools and put them on the shelf so that artists can just drag and drop those into the scene, just like you could with, for example, uh, a light actor, right? If you want the light, you just drag in a light. If you want a fence generator from Houdini, you can just drag in a fence generator from Houdini. And it actually also ships with uh, a couple of out of the box tools, like scatter tools, blind tools, and a couple of other really convenient ones. It's also uh, really flexible. Uh, so as soon as you've made your procedural asset, you can also say, you know, bake it down to a, a native uh, Unreal Engine static mesh or even modify any of the U properties. So if, for example, by default, you always want to have the static mesh uh, not simulate physics, there's like a checkbox instead of static mesh um, editor, tell Houdini, you know, tick that box or untick it, it can do that for you. But it can, of course, also automatically drive things like material instances. Um, so for example, you know, set the roughness to this or assign these textures or change this, change that. That's all stuff you can do. So what does it have for uh, developers or engineers? Um, Houdini Engine is really accessible. The entire plugin is actually open source. It's on GitHub, meaning it has a high level of customizability. Anyone can go in uh, that, you know, no C++ and modify how something works. Uh, for example, if they have a custom build of Unreal or they want to add additional features, they can just do that themselves if they want to do, th do so. Um, Houdini Engine is multi-platform, so we support Windows, Mac, and Linux. And we update these uh, in daily releases. So Houdini has a daily release cycle so that as soon as um, you know, we fix something or we add something or a user has a request, uh, most of the time you have that the next day. You don't need to wait until you know, side effect says, here's the new version of Houdini. No, you can actually get that the next day or you can actually get it the minute as soon as it's submitted on GitHub, right? Super convenient, uh, super easy. And then we actually have an announcement to make regarding Houdini Engine. We're announcing uh, version two of the plugin, which is a complete uh, rewrite on the core architecture of the plugin, because a lot of people don't actually know this, but Houdini Engine was built on Unreal Engine 4.5, right? So that's a really, really long time ago. Um, the actual details on the um, uh, the things that change or added, you can find that here on uh, on this link if you go there. But I just highlighted a couple of them that I think people are going to be really excited about. So there we go, really excited. Uh, we will have Blueprint support, something that people have asked a lot for. So what you will be able to do is, for example, have a Blueprint actor and have that have a Houdini digital asset uh, component to it which means that through Blueprint, you can actually drive presets, parameters, and anything else through construction script or Blutility. We will have a PDG asset link. PDG asset link is something that will be able to uh, manage complex dependencies and um, allow you to distribute async cooking. 
So instead of, if for example, you have an entire massive landscape and you, you know, you have everything be procedural or only parts of it, let's say you generate a procedural landscape, right? Then on top of that, you have a procedural road. On top of that, you have, you know, procedural foliage around the road. And on top of that, you have other things. As soon as, you know, for example, you move the road a tiny little bit, uh, Houdini wouldn't really know what the connection is between the road and the landscape unless you've explicitly told it, if I change this, modify that. Well, with the PDG asset link, it is going to be able to know if I move the road in this region of my landscape, I don't need to regenerate the entire level. I only need to regenerate this particular region around the part that I modified. And it doesn't really need to do that on your local machine you're working. So let's say you're working on a, a, a network, right, which has a, a computer farm or a, um, a compute farm somewhere else in your building or, or offsite, you know, Amazon AWS or something like that. You can actually have Houdini Engine cook everything on a remote server, right? Which means that it's async, allowing you to keep working in the editor while in the background Houdini is cooking. And as soon as it's done, it will automatically import everything, making it really easy for you to, uh, to keep tweaking things. Um, we'll also um, make lots of changes and improvements on the UI and UX based on the user feedback that we've received. So since everything was built with Unreal Engine uh, or was built in Unreal Engine 4.5, uh, lots of it isn't really native UI code that uh, Unreal has in you know its current releases. So we're rewriting that, giving us a more improved uh, parameter UI we'll be able to have default values, something very important uh, that we're going to support. And you'll be able to do ex set expressions and create expressions in parameters as well. Another thing that uh, people have really been asking for is the ability to have uh, Houdini engine be level independent. So what we're going to do instead of having a Houdini actor in every single scene, uh, we'll actually extract that and only have the HDA component inside of your editor just have data, right? So the parameters that you saw in, on the digital asset and all the cooking, all the processing, all the geometry, all the data happens externally, meaning that you can have Houdini Engine tell it, um, you know, generate a tree in that level, generate a tree in that level, generate a tree in that level, instead of, you know, generating a tree in this level, going to a different level, generating a tree there. And we'll be able to do that with world composition, meaning that, you know, you can basically generate an infinitely large uh, game with uh, Houdini Engine and Unreal through uh, world composition. Another thing that um, a lot of people have uh, mentioned is that um, the mesh creation currently with Houdini Engine, you know, has a little bit of a delay. And uh, so what we've done is instead of uh, going through the um, the default static mesh generation, which is uh, a slow process because once again it's it's optimized, it's a static mesh, it's not meant to be modified. We're going to be looking at the uh, editable mesh component, which, like the name says, is editable, meaning that you will have a really, really fast um, update rate. So as soon as you change a slider, you will have the result almost immediately or even immediately, depending on what you're doing. Uh, so that's something that people have asked for a lot. And yes, we are working on that, and uh, you will get that. Uh, the timeline for uh, this plugin. We don't have a date to tell you yet, but I can um, tell you that this will be, you know, somewhere, expect something around the end of the year. So that's uh, announcing V2. We're actually also looking for an Unreal Engine developer, uh, which can help us build, uh, you know, this new version of Houdini Engine. So if you're an engineer and you have, you know, C++ experience um, in Unreal, you don't necessarily need to know Houdini. That's just a plus that you could have. If you know Unreal and you're a developer, contact us. Um, go to sidefx.com slash careers, find the application that says Unreal Engine for developer, and um, you know apply, and we'll uh, be happy to listen to you. So all this cool stuff that um, we've shown you today, I'm sure that uh, lots of people who haven't used Houdini yet are like, Houdini is probably expensive and so forth. You can actually go on online to sidefx.com slash download and you can download a free version of Houdini uh, called the Apprentice version, which is a completely free license, which you'll get as soon as you install it, allowing you to essentially rebuild anything you want. There are no limitations inside of Houdini um, limiting you from doing anything. You can render, you can do simulations, you can do lots of other stuff. The only thing that we really limit you uh, with is, um, you know, 
file formats you can export with. For example, you can't export FBX. Uh, you can only render to a certain resolution, but it doesn't really matter because um, it's really meant for learning purposes. Later on, when you feel more comfortable, you can look at other uh, types of licenses. And that's really um, all the things that I, um, I have to mention. Uh, one other thing, Houdini Apprentice cannot be used with um, Houdini Engine inside of Unreal. But if you want to do that, uh, SideFX is always sponsoring the uh, Unreal Engine game jams, which is when you'll be able to get a free two month um, Houdini Indie license. And that does allow you to uh, use Houdini Engine instead of um, Unreal. So, you know, use the Apprentice version to learn Houdini. And then once you participate in a game jam, feel free to reach out to us and we'll give you a free uh, Houdini Indie license for an evaluation for, uh, time for the game jam. And that's uh, all I really have to uh, say today. So thanks for listening. I think now we have uh, lots of questions to, to answer if there are any. There are certainly quite a couple of questions, but um, it looks like the uh, side effects game teams there have been responding um, to almost all of them in chat, but I definitely do want to bring some of them up on the stream. Thank you so yeah. much for that presentation, oh. Paul. That was a lot of very, very, very cool um, <laughs> and useful information. There's a lot of people excited about using Houdini and Unreal. So. That, that's really neat. See if we can get Ben back on as well. Is he still on the line? But doom, 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 yeah. pop. There's Ben. There's Ben. All right, got to get this mirror thing working mm -hmm. out. Hi, Ben. <laughs> Ben's back, I'm everybody. Back. Um, yeah, so questions. Let's start off from the top. Definitely going back to some portions of the, um, the earlier portion of your talk. And uh, okay. one of the viewers are wondering if it's possible to make cloth and import into uh, import into Unreal Engine as uh, as a physics asset for skeletal meshes. OK, uh, yes. The answer is yes, you can. So um, we have two types of tools that allow you to export any types of, of simulation or, or effect that you've made in Houdini. Um, so for example, you know, a cloth simulation. You can export it uh, using a shader approach, using something called vertex animation textures. It essentially just encodes all the movement in a texture, making it really lightweight. But that doesn't allow you to use you know, the physics engine inside of Unreal to apply additional simulation on top of it. So we built a second tool called a skinning converter. And the skinning converter essentially just looks at you know, your cloth simulation. And then it figures out, where do I need to place bones so that you know, it creates an automatic rig with the animation, meaning that since it's bone-based, you will have you know, your physics assets be generated inside of uh, Unreal, allowing you to, a real, to do a real-time uh, physics simulation on top of that if you want to. That's super cool. I would actually like to see that workflow. Yeah, I um, think we, uh, we actually showed it on the previous live stream, like a long time ago. OK, um, I'll try to dig that up and, and post it in the announcement yeah. post so that um, anyone can find it if they're, if they're interested. And so referring to the, uh, the Steam texture sheets that you were showing mm -hmm. um, the first section, they were wondering if they were available from some kind of predetermined noise algorithms uh, or if you have to provide your own. So the, the noise that we used, uh, that we were blending together, I think that's the question, right? The noises that we used for blending? I believe so. OK. So um, you, you can do anything. So the noises that we used, I think, are just the default um, noises that we ship with. You're just a drop down and giving you lots of options and you know control the frequency, the amplitude, uh, you know how often it repeats, offset, and so forth. But if you want to import your own custom noise algorithm or write your own, you can also do that. So you can use what we have, which is what we use for the cinematic, or you can even write your own or modify it. So both are possible. That's great. Uh, they were wondering what resolution the uh, the Steam texture sheets were at. Oof, that's a good question. Um, I think those are since it's a texture sheet and we're we're doing you know cinematic, it's probably somewhere around 4K, maybe 8K. Um, but of course, you can you know apply MIP maps or export them at the lower resolution if you want to do so. So the more frames you want and the higher resolution you want each frame to be, the higher the resolution of your texture sheet needs to be. But I, I don't have the actual answer to that. I just assume that it's either 4K or 8K. OK. Pretty high res then. Um, there was a question about releasing the rebirth scene for learning purposes. And as far as I know, last week when Quixel were here, they let us know that they will be releasing a scene using some of the mega scans and assets that were part of rebirth. But the actual final project, um, I don't believe that will be available. 
but there will be a, a, so. a, a pretty sweet sample there that you can use and tear yeah. apart and figure out how um, how a lot of it was made. Yeah. Um, let's see. This was answered, I believe, by, uh, by one of the side effects side effects people. But uh, will there be um, will there be a link to learn Houdini and how to create clusters with Niagara? And I believe the answer was that. And they also linked a, a tutorial um, that was from earlier this year where you can see how you can how you can do that. Correct. Yeah. Pretty sweet. Yeah, I, I, I put it in the chat. Over there. <laughs> Over there, somewhere. <laughs> um, what was the timeline from concept to completion for the cinematic? I think we mentioned that last week, but I was curious if you yeah. guys might know. Um, I don't know the exact start date um, that Quixel started because they started, you know, before us, of course. Uh, they had to do all this pre-production and do the actual scanning trip of, you know, scanning all the assets in the real mm -hmm. world. Um, so that was. I, I don't know when, but uh, when side effects got involved, that was actually really October. And we built all the tools that you saw until around December. And then December onwards, until leading up to GDC, we were more of a um, support role, right? So we gave all the tools to Quixel. The artist did an amazing job using those to build the cool shots you see. And we just helped them if they ran into problems. So for us, it's October until December uh, for the main part. Yeah, if you're really curious, I, I I know that we mentioned that during last week's stream, so I, I just don't remember the exact uh, the exact timeline there. But it was, I believe, it was close to a year from the final for, from the first idea that something was supposed to happen. But I believe the work started somewhere in um, around October there as well. Maybe the scanning trip was before that. We'll have to go back and um, look at that. Another um, reason to watch previous week's stream, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there's uh, Galen showed off. Um, pl plenty of interesting things there as well. Um, referring to the mountain ranges that you were using and when you were showing how to mm -hmm. use the tools to to blend them, um, one of the users were curious if, so some of those ranges were pre-made and mm -hmm. they were wondering if you just manipulate them with erosion tools and they were asking what if you're trying to make a specific range? Right, so uh, the, these meshes that you saw me at some point rotating around, right? Um, those, those are basically just the open topography elevation data, right? That's the height map, which is a you know, real live mountain. We took that data, brought it into Houdini, and we didn't just use it as is from open topography inside of the cinematic. We you know, did erosion on, on there that made it look like Iceland because we can't just use you know, Alaska. It needs to look like, um, like Iceland, and we wanted to have it look in a certain way, which of course you don't directly get from the real world. So we did erosion, did lots of processing on there, and then used inside of uh, Unreal. As for the uh, the ranges that are unique, well, one of them I actually showed, right? That's the one with the three mountains. Uh, there you can see we just handcrafted that. We didn't use any uh, elevation maps for that. OK, nice. Um, and it's all meshes, once again. Cool. The, um, I'm curious, what, what format does Houdini export meshes out of uh, to Unreal Engine? We, uh, we support a really, really wide range of uh, geometry formats. Uh, the main format that people use is uh, just FBX. Uh, you can also export OBJ. Uh, you can also export uh, BGO, which is a Houdini format, which you can import into uh, Houdini Engine, which makes you know really lightweight, uh, Alembic, and uh, tons of other formats. So we support most standard formats there are. That's great. Um, a question for you, Ben. Uh, what are the restrictions to the indie license? Size of company, size of studio, et cetera? Um, it's basically just how much money you make. So if you make under $100,000 US per year, you can use Houdini Indie. And Houdini Indie has all the features of regular Houdini. Uh, so the goal there is really you know, let people get it pretty cheap to get started. And then, you know, hopefully they're really successful with the indie license and make a ton of money and then they buy the full uh, commercial license. But yeah, it's really kind of great for people to get started and freelancers who, you know, aren't making tons of money. But um, yeah, check it out. That's awesome. Um, they were curious if the Houdini engine, engine significantly increases the project size. Uh, in, in this project in general? 
Uh, just just in general, yes. So I guess when you enable Houdini Engine, uh, they were curious. Oh, okay, Houdini Engine, right. Um, I don't know the exact size. Um, I, I think it's somewhere between two or three hundred megabytes. Might be, might be more, might be less. I don't know. Uh, but that's stuff that only increases the project size during editor time, right? As soon as you, you know, release your build and you know ship it to uh, to users. For example, a mobile game is a good example, right? You don't want your app to be three hundred megabytes by default because you use Houdini Engine. It doesn't do that. Houdini Engine gets stripped out as soon as you build. So you only have native mesh components, uh, skeletal meshes, and everything else that uh, Unreal supports. Right, because it can only do it in editor at a time, right? So there's there's no yeah. reason to package it out um, for right. runtime. Um, I had a question, which is if the uh, the new Houdini plugin will work with our new editor utility widgets. You mentioned Blutility there. That's a developer question. Uh, so that's something that Damien, who's in the chat, probably uh, can answer, and otherwise we can follow up. All right, chat. We all call for Damien. Because Victor needs answers. Um, hopefully, we, hopefully I can get that answered. But I was really curious. Um, so let's see. I actually don't know what an HDA file is. But is there a way to create HDA files that take up a few megabytes that contain just the math and instructions to generate procedural assets when the game is either installed or at first run, or, or for the first run? So HDAs um, are not usually not megabytes. It's just you know nodes and instructions. So they're usually kilobytes. Um, but to answer your question, it's only editor side, right? So if you can't deploy, um, you can't deploy an HDA to a final consumer, right? They as soon as they download your game, they won't be able to play around with sliders anymore because that's runtime. Uh, there are other ways of doing this, but it's not really straightforward. You could, of course, you know, create your own interface inside of your game with sliders, which it then sends to an offline, you know, server somewhere, and then stream in the resulting geometry. So that's one way of doing it, but we don't support that out of the box. All right, and then just to, re uh, actually, that one has already been covered. Um, they're definitely curious of when the second version of the plugin is will, will be in everyone's hands. Play around with it. Um, which was uh, some sometime at the end of this year, I believe, was your was your answer. Correct. There. And um, updates will follow. You know, the closer we get. But yeah, the next easy. question was actually if the um, the new update might be coming to the game dev toolset in Houdini. Oh, let's see. Let me let me phrase this correctly. Uh, is there a new update coming to the game dev toolset in Houdini with these new tools, or are they already available from GitHub? They uh, they've made. They have been made available uh, right after GDC, so they've been online uh, since March for free, open source. So you can grab grab them, see what we did. There's no hidden stuff right there. It's awesome. Go make things. Um, <laughs> tell us if you use them, right? We'd like to see all the cool stuff you do. Yeah, make make sure you hit us up with all your projects because we definitely like to browse through and see see what's being made. Yeah, and I should point out a lot of people don't even know about the game devs tool set because it doesn't come packaged with Houdini, so you need to get it from uh, GitHub. But we're always telling people to check out those tools because there's lots of awesome tools in there that are will probably eventually be rolled into Houdini proper. But at this point, the games team is making them so fast uh, that we want people to use them and show us what they're doing with them. So check out yep. the game dev tool set for Houdini. Check them out. It's 130 tools, right? All free, all open source. That's great. Let's see here. Um, can you create infinite procedural worlds with height field and world composition? Um, and then I, ending the question made uh, with essentially if there are any resources uh, to learn how you would be able to do that. Can you? Yes. Um, with V2, that will be a lot easier because it will um, natively comp uh, support world composition. Right now, you'd you'd have to go, you know, export uh, uh, textures, height maps, you know, tiles, and import that with world composition. But with V2 of the plugin, it can automatically write to all of these uh, uh, world uh, composition components. Uh, resources to do this, um, it's you just have to uh, look at the Houdini terrain tools. You can make them as big as you want. Um, we have lots of resources on learning how to use these terrain tools. And to do that, you can just go to the uh, side effects website under the uh, tutorial 
uh, section. And then you just type in high field or terrain and you'll get at least you know 10 tutorials telling how to do it. Awesome. Lots of which, of course, also in Unreal, so. Yes, we actually just got a little, um, we added a little bit of documentation to our, our landscape documentation regarding Houdini. So it's up there. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, it also has the link there, uh, so you can find it. Any plans to incorporate VDB for fire and fluid sims into Houdini Engine? Um, well, so, so you can't really render uh, volumes directly inside of Unreal. So I mean, we could add support, but there's no way, really way of rendering it. Plus, of course, that it comes with a huge overhead because imagine doing a giant, giant pyro simulation, right? And importing, you know, 40 million voxels, that's gonna blow up your game. Mm -hmm. So what we have instead is we built some tools that still allow you to do that, but sort of you know fake it in a way. It's not fake, but it you know it resembles something, but it's actually something else, and that is similar to the uh, the fog cards. So the fog cards were you know a volume, a VDB if you want, uh, that we just baked down to a texture sheet, giving you you know something that looks like fog or volumetric inside of the uh, the engine. Cool. Let's keep going. I think I've got two left, and then, then we can all get back to drinking coffee and browsing the internet, because that's all we do. Uh, <laughs> is Houdini getting any controls to lower or slow the dump of data back into <laughs> Unreal to keep from using all of the memory? Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yes. Is Houdini getting any controls to lower or slow the dump of data back into Unreal to keep from using all of the memory? Right. Um, so you can actually pause the cooking, right? So if, if you're using a Houdini engine, you can actually tell it uh, to pause the cooking in general. As for slowing or, or controlling the number of uh, the size of the memory it's using, I don't know if we have support for that right now. But like I mentioned in V2, uh, you can offload all of the processing to an external computer if you want to. And with PDG uh, as well, you can actually control the number of cores that are being used to uh, to process everything on local machine. Okay, so if you have a little uh, lower end machine, you, you get a little bit of control there so that it's it's not entirely freezing on you. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, let's see, last questions. Let's see if I can shape this one to be an actual question. There will exist to, um, let's see. Um, I think trying to ask if there are tools for the creation of mid slash close view of terrain uh, for erosion and rocks. So I, I believe the uh, question is if there are tools for creation of yeah sort of sort of much closer up um, look at erosion and rocks. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you know for this for this uh, cinematic we wanted everything to be you know. A bit further away, you know, super high resolution, super dense, but that's just a a setting or a slide or a configuration inside of Houdini. So if you want it to be lower resolution, uh, you can just, for example, use a, a poly reduce, which I showed with the car example, right? You can specify what the quality of the mesh has to be, number of polygons, the size of the textures, and anything else. So you can make it as expensive or as inexpensive as you want, depending on you know your target platform, be it mobile, be it console, be it uh, desktop. We have customers and lots of people using for all three. So it's not like you can only create super high res, you know, cinematic quality assets. You can make real time assets too. That's that's actually what Houdini Engine is mainly used for. Great. There's so much whole slew of information here, and I think um, Chat's very excited to uh, once again go ahead and check it out. There, um, I believe YouTube was a little sad that they didn't see uh, an in the in the license key getting thrown at them. So may maybe Ben wants to go ahead and um, be a little generous to, to our uh, to our YouTube audience as well. I'm not I'm not making that as a demand, but I'm just letting you know um, what the chat over there is. Oh um, uh, yeah, well I've been mentioning. looking at the YouTube. I've only been looking at Twitch. Yeah, we're doing um, the, we're we're doing both. Tell the time. YouTubers to come to Twitch next time. Okay, okay, <laughs> I I will. <laughs> well, you just did. Um, <laughs> so it will be there. Um, and as always, um, we'll get you next time. <laughs> all, all right. Well, and uh, I'm, I will definitely have you guys back. Um, probably it would be great to do something around the release of the plugin there, I think. Maybe 
go ahead yeah. and go over a little yeah. bit of work before that. So I think y'all can go ahead and look look forward to that. I am I'm definitely excited about it. Um, we do a survey every week. Um, if you are interested in letting us, sorry, if you are if you would like to let us know what you would like to see on the stream, go ahead and fill that survey out, and everyone who participates it. Uh, in the survey and gives us their email, we'll get a chance to win a t-shirt from our sweepstakes. Um, and then as always, make sure that you go ahead and visit uh, unrealengine.com slash user-groups, user-groups, uh, where you can see if there are any user groups around your area. You can go ahead and share what you're working on, possibly learn from other people in your community. And if you're, if you don't have a user group and you're excited about possibly making one there, go ahead and send us an email to community at unrealengine.com and we will help you know what that might involve and give you some resources and, and assets to sort of go ahead and get that started. Make sure you go ahead and visit our forums and if you are working on anything cool and exciting, make sure that you're sharing that with us and uh, you might be one of our spotlights in the upcoming weeks. We also would like to highlight once again, because we for a period there we were receiving some really cool countdown videos, but they tip down a little bit and we would definitely like to see more and what that involves is that you essentially take 30 minutes of development you record that you speed it up to five minutes and you send that to community at unrealengine.com with a logo and we can go ahead and uh, showcase your project at the beginning of the stream and if you're streaming on twitch make sure that you use the unreal engine category so that we can tune in say hi and possibly even raid you and that's what i believe we are about to do now uh, but first of that, special thanks to the entire team at SideFX and Houdini for coming on and providing all of this information. We will definitely have you back. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And uh, to all of you, everyone who's in chat, having a good time. Um, we're happy to have you here. And without further ado, we're going to say goodbye. And let's stick around for the raid. That is going to happen in a couple of seconds, whenever that time uh, countdown goes down. All right, that's it for us tonight today it's actually today or there's probably tonight somewhere around the world uh, not for you guys because you're on the other side of the coast but i'd say on the other <laughs> the, across the other pond that we're at there will be night in eh, just a couple of hours okay i'm done babbling that's it for today bye everyone bye, bye. thanks a lot Thank you.